We now go to Papa and Boy, where Papa is the idea of racism, and Boy is the pseudoscientific idea of biological race. Papa and Boy! Now, Boy, Boy, pseudoscientific idea of biological race, why are you still up at this hour? It's time for you to go to bed. Aw, oh, Papa, the idea of racism, I don't want to go to bed. I want to stay up and sort people into pseudoscientific categories based on primary colors and hierarchies. Now, now, boy, the way you're taking religious ideas around the great chain of being and natural hierarchies and the political program of dispossession of indigenous people and enslavement of black people fitting them all together with a bit of scientific jargon to give it the authority of the natural sciences. It's so good. As the pseudoscientific idea of biological race, you're making your papa, the idea of racism, so proud right now. But there will be plenty of time to naturalize hierarchical society tomorrow. Aww. It is time for bed. Okay, papa. Tomorrow's another day. Another day for both of us. I couldn't do it without you, papa. The way you feed the common sense of society through self-serving political views of the rich and powerful, it makes it a lot easier to create a pseudoscientific reflection of those biases using the language of science. Oh, son. Yeah, you know, well, I came first and I gave birth to you, so it makes sense. That's right, Papa. Racism came first, and from that came the pseudoscientific idea of biological race. Me, your son. I'm turning out the lights, okay? <laughs> Let it chip off the old block. everyone and welcome back to the seriously wrong podcast today we're joined by two special guests joseph l graves is an evolutionary biologist and alan goodman is a biological anthropologist and they together have just written a book which is called racism not race answers to frequently asked questions thanks for being here joseph and alan uh well thanks for having us man and it's a pleasure to be here on seriously wrong i love you guys oh thanks a lot um <laughs> so i guess first in the book, you argue that racism created the idea of race. I guess like the common understanding would be that race is this thing out in the world, that it's somehow biological, and then from that arose racism. And in your book, you argue that it's kind of the opposite. Yeah, uh, that's precisely our thesis. We talk about you know, the historical construction of racial ideas around human biological variation, and that essentially it was an, an attempt to fit a round peg into a square hole. But, you know, when you have social power, you can force the, the square peg into the round hole. And that's exactly what race science did over a couple of centuries. Yeah. And I would say, you know, just to add to Joe, that race wasn't anything that was out there in nature, out there in society. It was something that humans created, and they didn't create it as a scientific idea. They created it as a social, political, economic justification for racist acts, primarily slavery and colonization. And so in order to justify slavery and colonization, early forms of racism, you know, very virulent forms of racism, we needed a concept that would justify separating humans into different types of people, you know, hierarchically ranked, some governed by society and culture and governance and others governed by lesser means. And so race was invented to justify racism. Yeah. And another thing that you're listeners should understand is that it didn't really start in science or biology as they understand it in the 21st century. At that time, creationist religious ideas in the Western world dominated how people thought about nature and creationist notions about the hierarchy of human beings played a very powerful role in how naturalists began to think about 
the new groups of humans that they were coming in contact during the European age of colonization and discovery. And these events happened, you know, together. And so they were sort of interdependent, but they also had an independence. Biologists weren't just thinking about variation in humans. They were thinking about variation in the, the plants and the animals that they were discovering. And these things all mesh together. But the degree to which, you know, the race concept in humans came about, it was driven by the socio-political agenda that Alan and I talk about in the book. So with this, the time frame for sort of the start of race as we know it, would this be like like slaver colonial era? Yeah, it really starts with the voyage of Columbus. And, you know, there were theological questions that, that jumped out right away with regard to the discovery of these new people. I mean, were they human? Did they have souls? Um, their physical attributes were different from those of Europeans. Their cultural attributes were different. So this was a time period that, you know, European societies took over the Western Hemisphere and, and also enslaved millions of Africans to build their plantation-based agriculture in the Western world. So race as an idea, you know, we can't just say, oh, it was developed here and this place and this time, but it developed slowly through time, became more and more important with colonization, stealing of Native American lands in North America and South America, and obviously with slavery. But, you know, there are a couple key points in time. Uh, one in the book we point to is 1492, as Joe said, that's when Columbus, in big quotes, discovered the Americas. And, you know, so moving by ship versus over land, you know, one saw greater contrast between individuals. And, of course, Columbus was part of the, the need to colonize, conquest, Christianize, steal land, steal gold, etc., but 1492 was also the year that Jews were finally expelled from the Iberian Peninsula. And there's a bit of quasi, you know, proto-racial thinking in that Jews were seen to be distinct by blood. So concepts of blood became part of race. And then moving ahead, you know, initially during 1619, when the first enslaved Africans showed up in the Virginia colonies, they were not treated that differently from indentured Europeans, but eventually they needed to be separated from indentured Europeans. And so laws were developed in the Virginia colonies to particularly consider all Africans to be one group of people, one race, another law to prohibit um, mating and marriage between individuals of European descent and individuals of African descent. And so all of this is before scientists really got involved. And it was really in the 1800s where scientists all of a sudden came in to not just make the idea of race, but to try to reify it, make it seem real by, you know, putting the patina of science on it. And again, it's not the science we know today. It was science based in the notion of the special creation of human beings along a definitive hierarchy. So theories of, of race that developed in you know, England and the United States had a lot to do with whether one thought that there was one Adam and Eve, and those people were called monogenists, or whether you thought there was a separate creation of different in Adam and Eve's along that scale of perfection. Those were polygenists. And the reason why that was such a powerful theory, because they posited that non-Europeans were not members of the same species. And so in the same way that one has the right to, you know, domesticate a dog or domesticate a cow, Europeans had the right to domesticate Africans because they weren't fully human. Is the idea that there was different Adam and Eves for each of these races that were like ranked hierarchically? Yeah, that is exactly what it is. It was called the pre-Adamite races. The theory of polygeny came from the Swiss-born naturalist Louis Agassiz, who when he came to America, one of the first experiences he had was seeing a person of African descent and feeling disgust and then coming up with ways to try to explain why Africans were so fundamentally different from Europeans. 
originally monogenist ideas dominated, but close to the middle of the 19th century, the polygenists had completely taken over the discussion of race. And so you had some of the greatest names in American science involved in polygeny. And of course, you, your readers are probably familiar with Stephen Jay Gould's work, Mismeasure of Man, which talked about, uh, you know, I'm trying to pull this guy's name. Samuel and, Morton. Yeah, 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 Samuel Morton. Morton was considered the greatest person in American science in the 1850s. He had a huge skull collection at his laboratory, which I think now would be the University of Pennsylvania. You know, he measured and he, he ranked groups of human beings based upon skull volume. And actually, one of the most important pieces of work that Charles Darwin does is take on the polygenus in The Descent of Man in the chapter on race, where he demonstrates, based upon the science of the time, that there was only one human species and not multiple human species. That's really interesting. I I guess when I'm thinking about the sort of common sense here, or what you like commonly hear people say, I feel like one way that people might approach it is like, okay, people from these different groups, they look different, they have different skin colors, there's a variety of differences that you can see between what we call races. Why is race not biological in that context? Because I feel like if I talked to like extended family members and stuff and said, hey, race is a social construct, they'd be like, well, but people look different. And like, that's sort of good enough for them to believe that, <laughs> that race is meaningful and biological. Alan, do you want to go first on this one? <laughs> sure. And Sean, your experience is most people's experience. In, and that's one of the, the difficulties of this intractable myth is that like a flat earth, like, you know, the sun revolving around the earth, our cultured brains train our eyes to see race. And what we really see is variation, you know, physical variation. Most of that variation is what we call local. You know, we're all genetically unique, except for identical twins. And yeah, human variation is obvious. It's out there. Race is a outmoded and nefarious way that we've been taught to describe and explain that variation. And like the little homunculus that was supposedly in sperm as a fully formed human, let's put that idea on the scrap heap of dead scientific ideas. So I'll I'll give you, if I can, maybe a, a simple graspable explanation and then a little bit more technical one. The simple graspable one, I hope, is that if you were to take a bunch of individuals, say, in from different continents, some individuals from Africa, who we might say are one race, and Europe, another race, Asia, another race, and you ask yourself the question, which two individuals might be most different from each other genetically? You know, have the most single nucleotide polymorphism differences from each other or microsatellite differences from each other. You know, if you thought about it or you, know, you used race as your kind of guiding principle, you'd say, well, must be, you know, an African is different from a European or a European is different from an Asian or something like that, that one individual from one race must be most most different from an individual from another race. Well, that turns out not to be true. And in fact, the correct answer is to Africans in general, on average, would differ more from each other than even an African would from a European or Asian. And that makes incredible incredibly great evolutionary sense because Africa has the greatest genetic diversity of any continent. And in fact, instead of being different races, technically Europeans and Asians are kind of a subgroup of Africans. They came out of Africa. They were bottlenecked. There was pretty recently that they came out. So they haven't had time to develop that much genetic difference from Africans other than some superficial traits like skin color, which is actually really pretty recent evolutionary development to lighten skin color probably about 6,000 years ago. You know, truly, we're all Africans genetically. 
So I hope that that made sense as a simple, like two Africans are more genetically different from each other than an African is from a European and Asian. And the more complex explanation that Joe can jump in on is that population geneticist Sewell Wright kind of dealt with this question in the 50s and 60s of saying, when can we really know that there's something like subspecies? that a species is really beginning to divide into distinct groups and types. And he developed something called the F-statistic. And basically what the F-statistic is, is it's the amount of variation found within the group over the total amount of variation in the species. Humans don't have that much variation to begin with, which is interesting. And f that is above 0.25 is sort of thought to be beginning speciation. So an example, East and Western chimpanzees that are very close to each other have an F statistic of 0.32. So even though they live close to each other, they're beginning to form something looking like separate populations or subspecies. Humans, depending on what system you look at, their FST values are something like 0.12. So they're way below the threshold for subspecies. So race just doesn't work as an explanation for human variation, and it definitely doesn't work as a descriptor of human variation. If you want to know what explains the pattern of human variation, it's not continental, it's continuous and due to evolution. And the most difference, the way to explain differences between two groups is based on simply geographic distance. Uh, Sean? I, I honestly have to step in and apologize that my esteemed colleague Uh-oh. went went for the nuclear option with regard to explaining the silliness of racial ideas. Okay. <laughs> okay. Because, you know, when, when we do the genetics of human population variation, racial notions just collapse. But the question you asked was, you know, I'm talking to my family and they see physical differences and they say, well, that means there must be races. But race doesn't even work at the level of physical traits even skin color. So if we actually looked at the variation of human skin color, it's continuous across the globe, depending upon latitude. And in addition, if we were to use the evolutionary history of human beings, and then, you know, superimpose upon it, skin color variation, skin color variation would not match the evolutionary history of our species. For example, if you look at indigenous Australians, who live in the tropics, they have dark skin like indigenous Africans who live in the tropics. But if you look at the genetic distance between Australians and Africans, it's actually further apart than the genetic distance between Africans and Europeans. And so skin color doesn't allow you to partition groups of human beings in ways that make sense given our evolutionary history. And no other physical trait does that either. You know, bone density doesn't do it tooth type doesn't do it, Um, you know, general anthropometrics between, you know, body size and body length doesn't do it. Ashley Montague in the 1940s had pointed out this principle of discordance, which showed that, you know, if we tried to do this with physical traits, we wouldn't get the same sets of relatedness that we know from the evolutionary and genetic history of our species. So if physical traits don't work, then there's no way in the world that when we start looking at the genome that we're going to recover biological races. So why is this important? And one reason it's important because we pile so much into trying to explain differences we see in health, wealth, etc., as, oh, they must be due somehow to innate biological or genetic differences. Well, that's bullshit. Today's episode of Seriously Wrong is brought to you by race. Just not working that well as a concept for what it's trying to do. 
Think of it this way, a map needs to get you somewhere. And if a map isn't accurate, it's gonna lead you astray. Now imagine you're trying to find a treasure, right? And you want a treasure map that's got the dotted line with the X where the treasure is. But then someone gives you a treasure map that doesn't apply to the territory you're on, which doesn't lead you to the treasure. It says there's mountains where trees should be, or there's water where land should be. You know, many mistakes you can make on a map. It could even just be like way too simplified. You know, it says go left. And you're like, I don't, I can't even orient myself on this map. It's just a green circle with two dots near each other and blue around it. And it's like, that kind of represents anywhere on the planet if you make it rough enough, but it's, you know. Yeah, and according to the, what's it called? That little thing up in the corner that tells you what different symbols mean? Uh, the legend? Legend. Yeah, I think legend. That's right. a word for it. So maybe you're looking on the legend, you're like, oh man, actually this whole time, the drawing of a tree has referred to a mountain. So I thought looking at the map that when I right. saw a tree that that meant that there was trees there, but actually this legend is revealing some of those trees are mountains, but not all of them. It says in small text. If you see a tree on a map and it's not a mountain, there probably will be trees there, though not always. And sometimes also the watered areas can include trees. That's just an example of a map not fitting the territory and just not working. It's not a great map and then you won't get any treasure. So when it comes to the pseudoscientific idea of biological race, it is a type of map where the treasure at the end of it would be something along the lines of, you know, having justice, treating people well, having a society that doesn't enforce arbitrary historical social hierarchies onto innocent people and so on. And has a scientifically accurate understanding of variation amongst human populations and all that kind of stuff. That's the treasure. And then race, this idea of biological race, because of the place where it came from and the way that it developed over time, it's such a malformed map that you're going to be as fundamentally confused as the first map example we gave. And that's why Race Just Not Working is the sponsor of the show this week. Now back to our show. The Seriously Wrong Podcast is a listener-supported show. If you like the work that we do and you want to help us keep doing it, head over to patreon.com slash seriously wrong and sign up. For just $6 a month, you get access to everything on there, a full archive of episodes, bonus content, access to the Discord server where we do the book club and the live show recordings. So if you want to be on one of those, head over to patreon.com slash seriously wrong and sign up. We can't do it without you. Thank you to everybody who's already donating and who is about to go donate right now. And now back to the show. Something that comes to mind is, you know, biological race isn't real. Race is a social construction. I can imagine some people saying then the answer to the sort of problem of racism is to ignore race or like sort of treat race as if it doesn't exist and put all discussions of race and racism aside. You know, you're making the standard mistake and the one that we're trying to redress with this book. And that is, I never use the term race without modifying it. So if you're talking about biological races based upon modern evolutionary and genetic science, there are no biological races within the human species. But if you're talking about socially defined races, socially defined races were created through the process of social construction, and they are very real. I always say they're as real as a heart attack because, quite frankly, one's social position in racialized societies like the United States can give you a heart attack or you can end up with a knee on your throat like George Floyd. So socially defined race is real. It has real consequences with regard to where you live, what you eat, whether you're going to be killed by the police, whether you're going to go to prison, whether you're going to get a college degree, how much wealth you will accumulate across your lifetime. Socially defined race is the subject of study in sociology and political science and economics, but it is a different concept from biological variation within our species where the concept of biological race has meaning. And, and by the way, there are species that have biological races. We just don't happen to be one of them. Yeah, this is uh, lazy is probably a nice way to say it, to say that just because we don't have biological race, we should 
ignore race. You know, let's just do away with it. And I trust that listeners and I trust most individuals can get, as Joe says, that there are two different ways to think about what race is. One is that it's based in biology, and the other is that it was invented by us. And I think it would be great if individuals could begin to say, yeah, I am seeing variation, but I'm seeing it through a racial lens. And that racial lens is taught to me the day I'm born. You know, it's the smog I breathe that I'm looking at variation through race. And then one can begin to look at differences in life expectancy, heart attacks, et cetera, and say, why is that so that there's such glaring differences in COVID rates, infant mortality, family wealth? on and on and on incarceration by race. If it isn't due to biology, and it isn't, then it's got to be due to history, current experience, maternal experiences passed down to their children, lived experiences, development, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we live in a racialized society. You know, race is important. Countries like France tend not to collect data by race. And I think that puts them at a real disadvantage when it comes to human justice, because if you don't collect data by race, you can't recognize that there are injustices and inequalities by race. Uh, We do it. We don't do it well. The census is based on Office of Management and Budget Directive 15, the census categories There's a little caveat saying these are neither scientific nor anthropological categories, but they are real categories. I mean, we live in a racialized society. We divide people by race, and that's social. So in the book, one of the sort of thesis arguments is that the idea of race has effects in the world and gives cover to racism. So I guess we've got the three things. There's race, there's racism, and there's human variation. How did these things relate to each other? Well, since we said that racism created race, when we think about the relationship between human biological variation, as we say, you know, in the book, it's wonderful. You know, we evolved in Africa. And I want to make this clear because people don't seem to really want to accept the truth of this science. Anatomically, modern humans evolved in Africa around 300,000 years ago. We stayed in Africa for over 200,000 years before the first groups of humans began to migrate out of Africa in small groups. Over that next time period, we moved around the world, acquired local adaptations, which really weren't that much. I mean, we're talking about things like altitude adaptation, adaptation to starchy diet, adaptation to Arctic conditions, you know, uh, lactase persistence, being able to digest lactose after weaning. So these weren't really like dramatic things that occur during this migratory path around the world. You know, skin color and complexion changed as people moved out of the tropics. So that's what gives us our biological variation in traits that people see. But those, you know, the significance of those traits with regard to our society is a result of a set of historical contingencies. In other words, there's no real reason why dark skin had to be associated with social subordination. It just happened that way, that Europeans seized upon African bodies to transport to the new world to help them build their colonial empires, and that they, you know, carried out a warfare against the Amer Indians who lived there. And, you know, in the Caribbean, they virtually exterminated them and drove them off their lands in North America. These are all historical facts, but history didn't have to unwind that way. That's what what happened. So human beings have biological variation, but that's not what explains how our cultures then evolved, how social hierarchy came into play, how people began to be willing to murder their neighbors, to steal their things, to throw them in chains, to rape and pillage, Those things are not driven by our underlying biology. They are the results of the way cultures evolved, decisions that people made. And we didn't have to end up making decisions that way. 
we live in a world where we're a biological entity that has variation like every other biological entity, but amongst the species on this planet, we are by far the most vicious and the most immoral in terms of the way we behave. So Sean, I'll answer your question maybe a little bit differently. The connection between race and racism couldn't be more intimate, couldn't be more connected. And, you know, I think to finally acknowledge that race is not based in biology, race is an idea, it's a socio-political idea, is not sufficient to overcome racism, not at all. But I do think it's necessary. Parenthetically, the reason why it's so hard to do it is because it's invested. We're so, as a society, we're so invested in seeing the world as having biological races. Something that you say in the book is that race has a chameleon-like nature, which changes its appearance to fit the needs of those with political power. And that's pretty much the way of all knowledge, uh, last I checked. So let me give you an example of that. I mean, in the Roman Empire... The Roman Empire didn't have racial conceptions the way we have in the Western world past Columbus, but but they did come into contact with people who were culturally different from them. So the Romans thought that the Britons, Gauls, and Germans were barbarians of very low intelligence, and they thought that Africans were civilized people of very high intelligence. Now, what was the difference between then and now? is that you know Africans were allies to the Roman Empire and the Britons, Gauls, and Germans were their enemies who were there fighting on the northern frontier. And so we can go through you know various historical, social, cultural contexts and notions of otherness change, whether you know they're ethnic or religious or racial, depending upon who's in political power and who their enemies are and who they want to suppress. One of the issues here is that if race is to be thought of as a scientific concept, you have to be able to nail it down. You need to be able to define it. You need to have a slide rule, you know, to say, okay, this is one race, this is another race, and it'll be that way all the time. And so just think about trying to make prescriptions or medical recommendations based on race if you've got this chameleon-like concept that's changing, not just from Roman times to the 20th century, but you know, throughout the founding, the first census in 1790, the racial classes or you know, that the boxes that one could check off are entirely different from each census, they keep changing and changing and changing. One changes one's race potentially when one goes from the United States to Brazil. And this is not because one actually changes biologically, but simply the political structures kind of box people into different races for different political and economic expediencies. So yeah, it's it's a chameleon. And that's one of the things that I think few people recognize is how can a scientific concept be so different through time? Another thing is that the idea of who is white changes. There's been a lot of great scholarship on the development of the concept of whiteness, kind of the hidden race of whiteness. And so Um, We tend not to think about white, but who is white has changed through time. And it's been of tremendous sort of political and legal consternation about who who gets allowed into the, the club of whiteness, who becomes an honorary white. We now go to the line outside club whiteness. Welcome to Club Whiteness. Can I see your ID? Here you go. I think I should all be in order. Take a look at that. Uh, yep, yeah, uh, looks all good. Oh, hey, your complexion, you look a little swarthy. What are what are you, Italian? Well, hey, I thought Italians were part of whiteness now. Uh, Italians are allowed in, but I just want to be sure. Look, I'm really sorry to have to do this, but we're going to have to pull you aside for extra screening. 
There's going to be a DNA analysis. It's really quick, just a mouth swab. It's a one drop rule. We're going to be objective about this. What, what genetic markers would you even use for that? White isn't a genetic category. We don't reveal which genetic markers we use. We, there's a proprietary special blend. It doesn't even make sense. Like if a person's half and half, why would they be assigned one race over the other? It's like kind of like white supremacist. It's, it's, I mean, if you had lighter skin, I would have just let you in without thinking but about it's it. Stupid. But I mean, the rules change from week to week based on like the political context and like what the rich and powerful want. I mean, they used to not let Irish people in. So the whole club doesn't make any sense. It's just like made to exclude people and be racist. It's like the idea of the white race is just like synonymous with white supremacy. I don't want this test. I don't want even want to- Okay, bye. Save a test. Man, we need to abolish this club. It's just, it's fucked up. And that was the lineup outside club whiteness. We now return to Wrong Towns Got Talent. Our next contestant's talent is concisely explaining the history of race. Can they do it in the allotted time? The judges will judge. Capital R race, as we know it today, this particular form of racial consciousness is fairly new, although there's records going back thousands of years of humans stereotyping other humans, typically people who live outside the bounds of their society. There's historical records of people in ancient India, ancient China, a variety of different places, making insulting comments about the skin tones of quote-unquote barbarians and so on, people who live far away from them that aren't part of their civilization. During the Crusades, there's this attempt by European Christians to retake holy lands. At that same time came a huge wave of domestic anti-Semitism with laws being passed that persecuted, outgrouped Jewish people in medieval Europe based on their lineage and bloodline, this sort of proto-racist mythology about different ethnic groups and outsider groups. So this idea of race as these large categories that we know today didn't really exist. According to Ibram X. Kendi in his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, prior to the slave trade in Europe, there's very little evidence to suggest that Europeans had widespread negative beliefs about dark-skinned Africans. But in the early 1400s, Portugal, trying to avoid Muslim slave trading routes, started making trips to Africa to take African slaves. It made the Portuguese kingdom more money than taxation did. They had to invent a mythology. Why is the slave trade good? It's making us so much money. We want to say that it's not just about money to us. So can you invent a mythology that's going to explain why it's okay that we're doing this? And what the biographers of the royal family came up with was people who were inferior. They're being saved by a superior civilization giving them a chance to convert to Christianity, thereby saving them. The first ever definition of the word race in a European dictionary comes in 1606, where they say race means descent. Therefore, it said that a man, a horse, a dog, or another animal is from either a good or a bad race. So from the start, it was a term that was used to rank lineages and categories of inferiority or superiority. But it was used in a much broader way than in the modern sense, because you could, for example, have a race of fishermen. It wasn't about these essential categories of skin colors. Race is a very fluid term to them at that time. You could be like a red-haired race or have different races of Europeans or African races or a race of Indians. But there's no such idea as the white race early on. During these time periods, the European colonists are making settlements around the New World. They're enslaving people, in particular enslaving Africans, for use in their cash crops. In the book, How Race Survived U.S. History, they outline how the first legal usage of the term white people came in the 1670s in Virginia, where there was increasing tension between the rich and the poor of all races. There ended up being a rebellion, what was called Bacon's Rebellion, where working class people across racial coalition, in modern terms, came together to stand up against the rich. It wasn't a purely racial solidarity like class is bigger than race moment. They also forcibly seize land from the indigenous inhabitants of the area, took out racist violence on indigenous groups. This scared the rich to see that power existing among the poorer classes coming together, expropriating things. They knew that their head was on the chopping block. And so they put into law for the first time a definition of a white race in the 1670s in Virginia that gave different rights to white citizens and black citizens, trying to create a wedge in this coalition. White workers in Virginia were basically given this bargain in exchange for subjugating black people further. They would give poor white people certain benefits in society, including better access to jobs, jobs that included enforcing the racial hierarchy explicitly, the esteem of being white in a society that values that, 
Over the course of the following centuries, the assumption that racial difference is embedded in the process of scientific inquiry first has roots in religious ideas, different Adams and Eves for different races, and a divine hierarchy, a great chain of being, becomes the sort of common sense pushed by the rich and powerful in society to help enforce this distinction between lower classes and keep them divided. In 1735, Carl Linnaeus, the man who invented zoological taxonomies in general, invented a pseudoscientific taxonomy that ranked people into colors, white black, red, and yellow, and ranking them with white at the top and black at the bottom, uh, sort of in the eyes of God in his racist white supremacist imagination. And from there comes the sort of emergence of the pseudoscientific biological idea of race. So looking at the big historical picture here, there's discriminatory labels and essentialism that goes back in history to a variety of degrees at different times, but race starts as a hierarchical justification for economic and social exploitation of either domestic populations, but especially foreign populations. And it goes through waves over centuries, ping pong between the common sense of the rich and powerful into institutions of pseudoscience. In particular, the colonial era of white slavers getting rich off of African slaves is the sort of trajectory where the current pseudoscience ideas of race emerge first as a justification for slavery, then as a tactic for the rich to keep the poor divided, and then through scientific naturalization as a justification for ongoing racial inequality. So that's the history of race, as quickly as I could. Wow. Wow. That, that was amazing. We love our history on the show. We want to thank you for that. That's beautiful. You know, we get a lot of talented people on this show, but very few people have the talent for history that you do. You know, a lot of singers, a lot of poets, a lot of dancers, and it's great. Don't get me wrong, but whew, that history, history of race. That's amazing. Absolutely brilliant. That's amazing. I hope you take, I hope you go all the way. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, it's always been my dream to go out there, try to briefly as I, as I could, and but accurately explain the history of the development of the idea of race. Um, and it's just a dream come true, just to get this far. You know, when he walked out there, I thought, what a schlub. This person, no way, going to be yeah, able to all, explain race. We're all looking at each other. Is this bloke for real? Well, you could just hear the hush go over the audience when he started. And Absolutely beautiful. Absolutely incredible. So in your book, one of the things that you two do really well and really interestingly is getting into pernicious uh, stereotypes around race. And there's about 100 questions in the book, frequently asked questions. It's like the subheading. What do you think are some of the most pernicious stereotypes around race, given cover by a pseudo-scientific sort of biological veneer? Well, the most pernicious one by far is intelligence. And you can see how pernicious it is because... Recently, Atlantic, was it Atlantic Monthly or the New Yorker, Alan? That ran the uh, the really nice piece on Paige Harden and her book. Uh, God, I think it was New York Times Magazine. It was New York Times Magazine, but also another very prestigious, high profile. I think it was the New Yorker. So, yeah. you know, and if yeah. they call you up and, and attack us for getting the wrong <laughs> magazine, I apologize. But the New Yorker ran this really slick interview and discussion of her of her book where basically she you know claims to be progressive politically progressive but wants people to recognize that genes are really where it's at with regard to understanding human potential and she carefully stays away from you know the past racial claims of intelligence but still she's everything she does in her book the genetic lottery is utilizing that same scheme of thinking, but just taking racial difference out because she, you know, admits that no one has found any genes associated with racial differences in intelligence. But, you know, using that edifice, of course, racists and racialists are going to go off and go back to their, you know, standard bottle of wine that, you know, Western society is the way it is because Europeans and, and they might admit to East Asians being genetically more intelligent than African Americans and Latinos. That's a pernicious position that we demonstrate there's no scientific basis for in our book. Something I was really surprised to find out doing reading on this subject was to find out like how long this sort of like bell curve type argument had been proliferated in the United States. 
I mean, like the early evidence came from eugenicists who use a type of IQ test on the U.S. Army and found the average mental age, they claimed, um, showing that like across the board, all soldiers had a low mental age on their thing, but in, in particular black soldiers. But it was like their IQ tests included things like recognizing brand mascots and stuff. So it's kind of ridiculous. But I... I was really surprised to find that like over the last, you know, century and a half, there's been this recurring thing of like all these books written decade after decade, popularizing these arguments, these racist arguments. Yeah, it's a little bit like, you know, the game of whack-a-mole. You're right. Every 10 years or there's a bestseller, The Bell Curve. I think the Pope had written a book at the same time, and thank God, you know, it displaced the bell curve as the number one book on the New York Times bestseller list in 1994. And, you know, just a complete piece of trash. And basically what the bell curve was saying, and Arthur Jensen, who wrote a piece in the Harvard Educational Review, an over 100-page article, one of the things Jensen said is that compulsory education has been tried and it's failed. And what he was referring to, this is back in 1969, is that um, Head Start programs for poor blacks and poor whites had been tried. They had boosted the IQ scores of poor blacks and poor whites. But then after a few years, after the programs, these little summer enrichment programs had ended, the IQ scores began to go down again. And so that was considered a failure. But that was an environmental intervention that was very short-lived, couldn't overcome prenatal influences entirely, couldn't overcome family poverty, couldn't overcome nutrition, couldn't overcome exposure to toxic pollutants. Yet people like Jensen interpreted those data as, oh, IQ must be based in genes. And really, there's two kind of leaps you know, big scientific errors. One that is that thinking that a complex trait like intelligence is predominantly due to genetics. And yeah, genetics does have some influence individual to individual, if in fact we could figure out how the heck to measure intelligence. But the big, big error is thinking that those unknown genes that help intelligence are somehow disproportionately found in certain groups and not in others. And that's entirely unfounded. And I can go further and say, you know, why do we even care? Well, I mean, the important thing that we demonstrate is the difficulty of defining intelligence. And scientifically, that's not a trivial problem. Because if you're going to make any sort of genetic argument, you have to be able to rigorously define the phenotype that the genes are producing. And so if you can't actually define a phenotype, then you really can't do any genetic analysis. And the people in psychometry sort of caught on to that because they realized, you know, there were different theories of intelligence. And when they tried to use modern techniques like genome-wide association studies on large groups of humans, they returned really incredibly small percentages of the variance of intelligence. So for example, a 2011 study found looking at, you know, tens of thousands of persons of European descent, they only could explain 1% of the variation of intelligence. That means that 99% of the variation in intelligence could not be explained by their analysis. So they got smart or smarter And they decided to use something that they could measure better, and that's educational attainment, meaning the number of years that a person goes in school, or they would throw in, you know, the highest level math course taken. But once you start going to these social traits, like how many years a person goes in school or how many, you know, math courses or the highest level math course a person takes, you're also throwing in all of these other unknown social cultural variables that you really can't account for very well either. So in the biggest study of this that was published in 2018 and that Paige Harden made the biggest argument in her book about, which looked at 1.2 million persons of European descent, they still could only explain 11% of the variation in educational attainment. 
which leaves you with 89% that you can't explain by the genetic markers. And by the way, they found over 1,200 genetic markers explaining this 11% of variance in educational attainment. And so at the end of the day, we, we have a science that's looking for a problem that it could potentially solve. And, and they keep doing this. And when Alan says, well, why do we keep doing this? The ideological value of being able to claim that the intrinsic attributes of a human being determine where they end up in a society is of great, great use to those who hold social power. And what Jensen argued and Hernstein and the bell curve was, well, black people are at the bottom of American society not because of racial discrimination, not because of generations of injustice and poverty, but because they simply don't have the genes to compete in a fair economy. That explanation is never going to go away so long as we have economies that favor one group of folks. In other words, you know, in 1990, there were 60 billionaires in the United States, and now there are over 600 billionaires in the United States. And as long as those folks can argue the reason we're billionaires is because we're so much smarter than everyone else, that explanation is always going to have currency. One thing that comes up in the book, and it's something I've run into in the real world, when you're talking to people, so uh, if you're familiar with Sam Harris, the atheist intellectual, at some point in the last couple of years, he started embracing these racist bell curve arguments. And I knew people who are listeners of his show who we're starting to get pulled in this really toxic direction and actually severed relationships over basically people caught up in this Sam Harris world becoming racist as a result of this. One of the arguments that they were making is that, oh, no, this isn't racism. It's actually we're interested in helping everyone as much as possible. And these genetic differences between races, they've got medical implications because certain racial groups get different medical outcomes than others or have different susceptibility to diseases and stuff like that. And that's a genetically tied racial thing. That was the argument they brought to me. And I said, I don't think that doesn't sound true. It doesn't yeah, can sound I, true can the I, way can you're I saying get, it. Can I get into here? Because that's absolute and thorough nonsense. And we spent you know, a chapter, two chapters, explaining why it's nonsense. And it goes back to those fundamental things that Alan and I discussed at the beginning of the book about biological variation. So the problem, of course, is that biomedical research and clinical medicine have never gotten on board 20th and 21st century evolutionary and population genetics. In fact, I have a perspective piece with my colleague, Dr. Andrea Dayrup, coming out in the New England Journal of Medicine in about a week or so, where we explain this and the need to redo medical education around modern biological anthropology and evolutionary genetics. And, and across the last year, I've been involved in a revision of one of the most widely selling textbooks in pathology, Robin's Basic Pathology. The 11th edition now has repaired a lot of the false racial claims of the previous editions. And the two of us have been doing grand rounds lectures at medical schools across the country. And we've been doing about one a week since we started in the fall. So we've talked at places like Hopkins and Harvard and MIT. Stanford is inviting us to speak at their DEI. I've spoken at Emory, University of California, San Francisco, a lot of the major medical programs. And these people are responding like, wow, we never knew this. So yeah, you know, I don't know the Sam Harris guy, but I do know that there was a time period in which a lot of these supposed critical thinkers jumped on the racial bandwagon as an example of demonstrating, you know, their opposition to political correctness. And what Alan and I have always, you know, held up is that our arguments are not made from, quote, political correctness, which by in and of itself demonstrates, you know, the positions they're coming from. Because anytime one challenges, you know, white male dominance of society, the first thing that people say is, oh, you're being politically correct. No, we make our arguments based upon scientific correctness and also historical, social, and political science that demonstrates how these ideas get picked up and reified and weaponized against oppressed people. That was great, Joe. And I'll just add, so you asked race on a medical form, 
you know, I, I go for bone densities. And I, so I'll ask the technician, gee, why do I have to fill out my race? And typically they'll kind of look at me strange and say something like, well, you don't have to if you don't want to. Or, you know, sometimes if you ask somebody that knows a little bit more, they'll say something like, oh, it's a proxy for genetics or something of that sort. But it isn't a proxy for genetics. It just doesn't work. There is no there there. And something your book picks up on in this area is that the misconception that there's a racial element to what diseases people will develop means that sort of like a medical racism can arise where people aren't being given the treatment and screening that they need because their doctors think that they're racially not susceptible to disease X or Y. Yeah, I mean, we, Andrea and I give a really good example about a girl who is socially defined as black and who didn't receive treatment for cystic fibrosis because the doctors at that hospital didn't believe that black children could get cystic fibrosis. Well, people of African descent can get cystic fibrosis because in the United States, African Americans vary in their percentage of European ancestry widely. And so one can get a cystic fibrosis allele in their European admixture. And there are also variants of cystic fibrosis, which do occur in Africa. They're extremely rare. And so this girl didn't receive treatment until she was eight years old. Normally, newborns are screened for cystic fibrosis and get treatment right away. One African-American man didn't receive treatment for cystic fibrosis until he was 54. So that's where these racial misconceptions lead us. People don't get the treatment that they should be getting because doctors are taught these racist heuristics. And the only time you really need, you know, a quick heuristic is when you're dealing with an emergency room situation and a patient is about to code. And that's generally not very often. So one doesn't have to use these kinds of heuristics to decide what kind of treatment a patient needs. And so we've been talking about how to restructure medical education, including, uh, for example, in the newer version of Robin's Basic Pathology, putting in inclusive images because things like, for example, skin tumors look different when you have dark skin versus when you have light skin. Changing the language in the book, describing you know skin lesions as being salmon pink. Well, they're only salmon pink if you have very light skin. And since 98% of the medical practitioners in the United States are persons of European or East Asian or some other descent other than African American, you know, they haven't thought about these issues as seriously as they should have, because it, quite frankly, it's not impacting their communities the way it impacts mine. I want to add a little bit about athletics into here, too, because I think it all relates and also has something to do with this kind of chameleon-like slippery notions of race. Not everybody thought this way, but the predominant opinion up to world, roughly the 1940s, World War II, um, was that Europeans and Anglo-Europeans were the cream of the crop when it came to everything, you know, that they were the most intelligent, they were the most athletic, they were the brawniest, they would survive, they had the best immune systems and everything going for them. And then all of a sudden in the 1930s, especially, that facade of excellence in athletics began to have some major cracks. Joe Lewis and Jesse Owens to point to two points in the 1930s. You know, Jesse Owens winning four gold medals at the Berlin Olympics. Joe Lewis becoming heavyweight champion and knocking out the German Max Schmeling. And so without kind of even paying attention to it, all of a sudden, white European theorists began to sort of change the paradigm and say that, oh, well, maybe there was a playoff between athleticism and things of that sort and intelligence, and one has to maximize one over the other, and that this was famously put into a racial prescription by J. Philippe Rushton, which Joe has written quite a bit about, and to say you know, that in evolution, we need to maximize one over 
either you know physicality and athleticism and ability to reproduce over intelligence or creativity and nurturing and um the point being, at one point, it was thought one way, you know, that all of these things kind of were part of the so-called white Anglo-Saxon race, and then all of a sudden, they were divided up in each race, sort of maximized, you know, certain characteristics. So it doesn't work. And basically, the same logic follows through for medicine, incarceration, intelligence arguments, there simply is no there there. It's looking at something that crumbles in your hands. You can't point to it. And so that's why, you know, Sam Harris's arguments about race and intelligence don't work. Nicholas Wade, who was a science editor of the New York Times, sort of said the same thing. It just doesn't work. There's no there there. It's just nothing. See, yeah, personally, I lived most of my life without having heard any of these pseudoscientific racist ideas. It was only in the last five years or so that I encountered them online. Of, I mean, there were some people who were that I've seen online who are like explicitly like, yes, I am an extremely racist person and this is my point of view. <laughs> but there's also people who push pseudoscientific racism from the perspective that they're like, quote unquote, free thinkers. The term that Sam Harris used on his podcast, and for the many of you who don't know who Sam Harris is, he is an American atheist who is quite popular in the early 2000s. But yeah, he used the term forbidden knowledge to refer to something that is... I mean, it's in a lot of circles, it is kind of forbidden to be racist, Despite but it's racist actually not pseudoscience. Yeah. So it, it's, but that's sort of the framing of like, that's how the advocates of people who, you know, sincerely claim they think that they're not racist, but yet they perpetuate and promote these sort of racist ideas. In that podcast episode, Sam Harris describes seeing protesters against Charles Murray, like being really mean to him at a protest, yelling or like not letting him speak. Uh, I think they might have actually prevented him from speaking. It's been so long, I can't remember. But that is what made him feel like, oh, I have to talk about this. You know, who he's being silenced. Like there must be something there to it, you know? Like it, it's this attitude of like, it, it's it's really weird how once you learn this history and seeing like how long these ideas have been around and how persistent they've been across time and how much actual research and science has disproven them over and over again and they continue to persist despite that seeing them like being pushed again and this time is like this like outsider thing they don't want you to hear the hidden truth this forbidden knowledge presented as this like tantalizing thing that like they don't want you to know the blue haired sjw's in academia don't want you to know but like really it's just like repackaged centuries old racist pseudoscience yeah there's this kind of like dipshitty anti-authoritarianism in it and like it's misunderstanding the shape of authority in a sense it's like you feel like like i can get the sort of urge to want to do something because it's forbidden or controversial and stuff but being forbidden and controversial in itself isn't like a good truth barometer even with like the majority of front-facing institutions are ostensibly in some way or another anti-racist committed to equity and so on as a matter of like how they position themselves in the marketplace it is still the case that like an ideology of elitism which includes a genetic determinist elitism exists within the highest structures of power in society but like yeah we shouldn't be configuring our position on factual matters based on who we're seeking to oppose by itself without actually evaluating the evidence and I think that is what some of this sort of like dipshit anti-authoritarianism does. And that like, this is an example of that. The Sam Harris's of the world thinking that they're sort of like boldly speaking up for the evidence by reheating centuries old pseudoscience that was made to naturalize racism and slavery. And then giving ammunition to legions of debate bros and comment sections, Twitch streams, <laughs> and elsewhere uh, to once again, yeah, reheat these ideas and the extent to which you still see 
yeah, you still see these weird biological essentialist takes turn up in common discourse, especially in debating conservatives and whatnot. It's very common in conservative circles to just continue to talk about these things as if they're true and to even use like new like terms to try and like give it another makeover for a new age because it wasn't working so far. Oh, yeah. The one you were mentioning before is haplogroups. That's one of the scientific terms they use to sort of like launder the pseudoscientific racism. Yeah, it's such an effective tool in a debate, too, because if like someone doesn't know what that means and they're like, well, actually, like I'm pretty sure most biologists say that racial categories don't meaningfully describe genetic groups of humans in any way, they can just like scoff at you and be like, any modern biology person will tell you race does exist. So it just They call it haplogroups now. You know, look it up, haplogroups. It's kind of like, you know, stupefying people by using fancy terminology. So in, in, in the context of like a Twitch debate or whatever, which I'm, I don't mean to endorse by mentioning, um, <laughs> in the context with a, in a Twitch debate with a racist, if they can bring out fancier scientific terminology than the person who's arguing the anti-racist perspective, and they don't know all the ins and outs of what all these words mean, and they don't, you know, th then they can create the visual impression of a disadvantage or loss by using this sort of like fancy scientific terminology. And let's, let's like the trend through this whole history, right, of like pseudoscientific racism is to launder these racist ideas through the veneer of science by making things sound scientific and making people who question their conclusions seem uninformed on the science if they don't know all the details and terminology of a field of study that's complex. Yeah. And I feel like it's aided in this instance by this being a relatively new talking point. I've only seen this like relatively recently. Uh, so there isn't like a lot of good posts. If you just search like haplogroup race, there's no like easy like debunking out there. But if you like look into what haplogroups are, you see like from what I understand, and I'm no expert in this, but a haplogroup is basically clusters of genes that are used as a way to determine ancestry using genetics. So there's kind of two big versions of haplogroups that get talked about. There's Y-DNA haplogroups and mitochondrial DNA haplogroups. And basically what these do is trace your genetic lineage back to mitochondrial Eve or the Y chromosome Adam. There's like two human family trees based on the patrilineal genealogy or the matrilineal genealogy that are spelled out through this genetic passing down and branching groups of things. So we run into problems is that if you sort people into haplogroups using this Y chromosome thing, you get different groupings of people versus haplogroups using the mitochondrial DNA chromosome stuff. But the specific thing I've heard people claim is that haplogroup H, which is the most common haplogroup in Europe, they, they were sort of making claim to it as if that's white people. But there's also other haplogroups that contain white people. And haplogroup H itself is a subtype of RO, which contains a lot of different people. There's Western Asians, North Africans included, some Ethiopians and Somalians. And RO is a subtype of R, which is a subtype of N. And there's also Europe, many, many Europeans spread out in different groups both within the umbrella of N and other ones. So I guess in this thing, there's a race that includes like most Asians, all European descended people and a lot of other different groups mixed together. And then basically all haplogroups are a subtype of L, even though there's like a rough thing where the L type is, the L subtypes that are named L contain most African people that we would think of as African today, but not all, not Ethiopians or Somalians. So if you glance at it, you can be like, oh, there's one type that contains nearly all Africans. And there's like three broad types. Like maybe this is kind of a version of what race could be. But as soon as you start looking at the details, like every other time you try to like take these racial categories people made and match them to biological markers, 
it doesn't actually work. And it only kind of works in this instance because you're looking specifically at a biological marker of ancestry, which is the same thing that like some of the visual cues that race is based on is meant to be a marker of ancestry. So again, in this instance, like the other instances as well, a scientific inquiry into the genetics of so-called races reveals that the map of race is utterly inadequate to deal with the genetic and biological territory, is what you're saying. Absolutely. If this is race, then we need to radically rewrite the race map. And all of those other things that we said were part of race have to be taken out of it. Like it's just DNA, mitochondrial ancestry through your matrilineal line. Like that's all it gets to be. It doesn't get to be all these other things that get mixed in because none of those other things match up to these groups. It's a nice talking point for them, but it really doesn't work when you take even the briefest look at it. Yeah. So it sounds like for people playing along at home who don't necessarily want to get into all the ins and outs of the debunking of pseudoscientific racism, um, it, co it hopefully comes up in your life infrequently enough that you, you don't have to arm yourself with that. But it sounds like most people, when they're encountering these pseudoscientific arguments about race, even if people are trying to stupefy them with fancy words, it, se it seems like it's safe just to be like, no, that's not true. That's not race. It, race doesn't match that. Look it up. <laughs> like, Yeah, I feel like if there ends up being a discovery where they finally figure it out, like they finally find the race gene or something i don't know like, yeah it's it would have be, to, it would be, you're not gonna find out on a twitch stream yeah it, it wouldn't <laughs> be some like obscure thing that like this person who was banned from twitch but is debating on youtube now uh it, like you know <laughs> for example might uh say in a debate like it's probably it's not going to come from there welcome to keyboard warrior radio theater Hey everybody, I just want to warn you that my next post is going to be extremely courageously brave against the repressive intellectual regime of our society that denies the facts. I've been doing research on YouTube, Reddit, the Chans, and I've uncovered facts which all major scientific authorities deny out of a combination of cowardice, malpractice, and liberal hand-wringing. They don't think freely, but I do. And what I'm about to reveal may shock you if you're closed-minded. You may reject it. You may reject me. And I just accept that comes with the territory as a free thinker. You're not a free thinker, and I am a free thinker. So I should warn you, if you can't handle true and hard facts, you might not like what I have to say. It might make you uncomfortable. Some people just have a disposition against thinking freely and they're too cowardly to admit it one of the things i really appreciate about myself is how i never flinch away from the truth i will valiantly go wherever the evidence and the data sends me no matter how uncomfortable and i know that is what my followers expect and that is what i shall continue to deliver wow that's so exciting i'm a new follower to your page but such a free thinker as well i love doing research to keep on the cutting edge of information i'm waiting with bated breath please reveal what new discoveries have you made what thoughts are being suppressed what ideas have come to light in recent years that aren't being talked about on the mainstream media can you reveal please we're all waiting Okay, here it comes. I've discovered that the political ideology of white supremacy is true because I read some studies done by white supremacists funded by white supremacists. So I'm racist. That's it. I'm, I'm racist. And we'll see you next time for another episode of Keyboard Warrior Radio Theater. The, the book is Racism, Not Race, Answers to Frequently Asked Questions uh, by Joseph L. Graves Jr. and Alan Goodman. It is really just an excellent, excellent book covering a variety of these arguments we talked about today in more detail. Um, and I want to thank you both for, for being here with us today and having this awesome discussion. Um, I think our audience is going to get a lot out of this. I think I want to say something about, you know, the crises that we're facing. And, you know, there are many you know, the pandemic to global warming to income inequality to going down the totalitarian rat hole. But I think racism is fundamental to all of those. And, you know, so that's 
part of, I think, the reasoning behind this book is that the connections between uh, disentangling and um, race and racism and trying to face racism as one of the most fundamental ways that we do inequality in this country and throughout the world, we treat people unequally through a racial lens. And that racial lens is, again, just a figment of scientific imagination. And Alan meant to say pseudoscientific imagination. Thank you, Joe. Let's not put us in with those guys. Yeah, seriously, I mean, you know, one, one of the things is one always has to be careful about using the word we, because quite frankly, I never bought into this nonsense. So don't don't use we when when, when I'm in the room. Okay, I'm not, Joe. I'm not them. Accept my apology. I, I feel that way too. Like uh, this is a side note, but a lot of the time people will say we when they're talking about sort of a large historical trajectory that predates them a lot. And I just want to be like, it's you. You can you can say it wasn't you. <laughs> like you know, like bringing on this sort of like ownership and like identifying with this trajectory that is larger than you and that you're not really factually a part of. And it's it's something that I always notice when people are saying we, when really accurately we're talking about they, we're talking about yeah. a specific group of people. I mean, and I think in the case when looking at like the pseudoscientific history of this genetic idea of race is that it's also like my read of from what I can tell is that these aren't just like, you know, innocent, well-meaning people trying to do science as best they can. They're making like scientific errors and distortions in order to advance a political perspective. That, that's a really good point. I, I think, you know, for instance, it, you know, it comes up a lot in discussions about global warming is that we humans, it's the Anthropocene and we've caused global warming. It's like, no, we didn't do it. It's, if anybody, it's a 664 billionaires that Joe mentioned that did it. And it's capitalism. You know, it's not the we as in some individual in, I don't know, Burkina Faso or the Balkans or, you know, that, you know, and I fear that if we don't finally make some headway in facing racism, we're screwed. You know, I mean, it's not just, you know, that we're continuing gross injustice, but that we're never going to come together. And, you know, one of the metaphors Joe and I have used is that, you know, if we're going over a cliff, be it, you know, global warming, be it totalitarianism, it will be people at color, of color at the head of the line going over first. But we're all probably going to go over. Yeah, I mean, I, I obviously I agree with Alan that we are at an existential moment for the thin veneer of democracy that remains in the United States. And that if we don't act on issues of racial justice, we will lose what remains of democracy. And if we lose what remains of democracy in the United States, democratic nations may fail across the world. And if democracy fails across the world, we're going to end up with, you know, the kind of totalitarian states that George Orwell imagined in 1984, you know, controlling the life prospects of everybody around the globe. And, and that, for me, will symbolize the beginning of the end of our species. In fact, the subject of my next book, I literally sent a book prospectus to my agent yesterday about the attack on critical race theory and, and how it's designed to be a cover for the seizure of power by white supremacists in the United States. I, I want to say something upbeat and maybe Pollyanna. And, you know, I've been thinking about the importance of education and also, I think, the limits of education, you know, how societies change ideas and things of that sort. And if we went back 15, 20 years ago, we would see a tremendous split between how scientists were thinking about global warming you know, how geoscientists, et cetera, and publics were thinking about global warming. And now the public is catching up. And my fingers are crossed that we're, we're going to do something similar with how we understand race and racism, that there's a absolute scientific consensus. You know, Joe and I are not on the periphery of this. We're just maybe more vocal 
about, you know, how human population geneticists, biological anthropologists, they all agree that race does not describe or explain human variation. Medical journals are beginning to do editorial policies in which they say that, you know, we're no longer going to accept using race as a category for human genetic variation. And, you know, so maybe with books like ours and other, you know, your podcast and others that we will all of a sudden see a sea shift, you know, a ground in public attitudes, and we will finally make some progress in understanding that the differences we see in income, et cetera, that we thought were maybe, you know, due to some mix of genetics and culture are really due to different forms of racism. Awesome. Well, I am, I would say, cautiously optimistic and hopeful. I feel like there's been some good progress in the last 10 years or so in terms of access to information that people have. That seems true. But the point that Joe is raising about the critical race, the anti-critical race theory movement and how that sort of white supremacist, that's the counterfactor, right? Like we've got people who are regular people as in like not part of institutions who aren't trying to like pursue a, <laughs> a white supremacist political agenda who are increasingly have access to the information to come to inform decisions at this. And at the same time, we have these well-funded institutions that are pushing the same way that they've pushed for the whole 20th century, trying to push these these white supremacist values through institutions. I guess it, it's it's going to come down to what we all do in the next in the next however many years and how we fight against these things and, and how we try to raise people's awareness. I mean, Sean, the re reason at least I collaborated with Alan to write this book is because I felt we were at an existential moment. We wanted to produce a tool that would help empower people to, f to move in the direction of fighting for justice. And it's important to, to recognize when, when we talk about we and them, I mean, people have taken sides on this issue um, from the very beginning, there were people who fought for anti-racist perspectives. Now, they didn't always do it as effectively as, as I would have liked. And everyone was influenced by the context of the historical period in which they were living. But this is a struggle that's been going on, you know, a struggle that scholars and everyday people have fought for justice against those who have been fighting for injustice. But let me be clear, guys. I don't have the luxury of the optimism that people of European descent have about social change. I, I just don't because this country has repeatedly disappointed black Americans. Okay, The fact that the Republicans stood against the, the Voting Rights Act bill just a couple of weeks ago. So no, I'm not optimistic. But on the other side of the coin, while I'm not optimistic, I have dedicated myself to fighting to the very end. And, and literally, we're at a point where we should be recognizing that the end could be in front of us in the same way that intellectuals in Germany in the early 1930s understood what could potentially happen. And some of them decided you know, to get out and save their lives. Others stayed behind and lost their lives. And that's literally, I think, what we're facing in the United States now. So no, I'm not optimistic, but I will fight. I do think that you know, we're fighting against way more organized and way more moneyed forces when it comes to the questions about 1619 Project, critical race theory, etc. And I made the comparison to global warming, but even there... There were, you know, Yale has a center for education about global warming, and there's nothing out there really that compares and, you know, that's trying to push publics to really come to understand what race and racism is, are really all about. So in that sense, I'm with Joe, a little bit pessimistic, but I think also that there are different ways to make change, you know, and I hate to reference back to the death of George Floyd, um, but, you know, that I hope was a key moment um, where people throughout the country, throughout the world said enough is enough. And so we'll see. And yeah, I'm going to keep fighting too.
Yeah, yeah, that's I mean, uh, reading this book, I feel like it is just an amazing resource on all of these different complex arguments. They're all very intertwined. And if you're getting in an informal conversation with someone who isn't aware of any of this history, and they're asking these sort of like, you know, maybe well meaning, innocent, but rooted in weird stuff questions, I feel like this is just an excellent, excellent resource. And like, there's things from it that I've learned from reading it, even having looked into some of the stuff before. It's like, very high compliments to the, the both of you for writing this. It's it's just an excellent book, um, and really really appreciate not just being here today, but the time and effort that you've put into uh, over the years to gain you know mastery of these subjects to pass on to other people. Yeah, it's just been an excellent conversation, excellent book. I uh, really really appreciate it. Well, thank you for having us, Sean. Thank you, Aaron and Sean. Oh, I forgot about Aaron. Yeah, he didn't speak right. up like the whole time. Sorry, Matt. <laughs> no, 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 it's all good. Yeah, thank you both for being here. And, you know, Alan and I stand on the shoulders of great minds that came before us. And because of that, we were able to see further. And and hopefully, because of what we've written, the next generation of scholars will stand on our shoulders and maybe, you know, see a way out of this nonsense before it's too late. Yeah. And um, as your next book comes along, Joe, uh, feel free to let us know when it's coming. It sounds really interesting. Well, the, the next book is actually coming out in the fall of 2022. And that book is called A Voice in the Wilderness. A pioneering biologist explains how evolution can help us solve our biggest problems. So that's already um, finished. It's being produced by Basic Books. It publishes in the fall of 2022. The one I described earlier is one that I will start writing as soon as I get an opportunity to get out of these classes I'm under this semester. Awesome. Well, yeah, sounds really fascinating. And just having recently been reading about the history of the eugenics movement and the development of IQ and a, a variety of these interconnected things. And in that journey, I found so much information about these pseudoscientific white supremacist orgs that are well-financed, people like Wycliffe Draper um, and the oh, Pioneer yeah. Fund <laughs> and... Um, you know, the Pioneer like, Fund actually came after me. To, like to chase you, to criticize and... To sue me for making claims against their then president, J. Philippe Rushton. How did that... When was this? How did this end up? Well, you'll learn about it in racism. I mean, in, in Voice in the Wilderness, which comes out in the fall. Perfect. You don't, don't want to get ahead of the next book. <laughs> Sean, um, I think you're going to have to wait for that one. <laughs> Next time on Seriously Wrong. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Social Justice Kaleidoscope, where the wrong boys take a look at some of the intersections between different types of oppressive hierarchical constructs. This week, we're going to be using the idea of biological race as our jumping off point, and we're going to be talking about the way that connects to other hierarchical ideas to help demonstrate how all of these ideas are tied together in the history of social hierarchy. The idea of biological race was a scientific version of a pre-existing idea which had a religious or social basis of a social hierarchy between different races, understood as being sort of designed by God this way to have a hierarchy between different races. And in the era of science, these ideas became scientifically, quote unquote, constituted with a set of ideas that were designed to reinforce that. Yeah, it, it's really interesting looking at so many of the different political issues of like major historical injustice and how so many of them in the last few hundred years ended up being taken in under this pseudoscientific biological essentialist 
framing of like this race is superior and this race is inferior and we've proved it with our calipers and whatever other motivated types of measurements we're taking so it applies in that situation but it also applies to men are superior and women are inferior and we've proved that biologically right yeah in both of those contexts the argument is kind of made through the assumption of a social hierarchy with people who are disabled being worth less than people who are not disabled so there's like this ableist current through both the patriarchal pseudoscientific denigration of women and the white supremacist pseudoscientific denigration of people of color. And just the straight up denigration of disabled people. Even if you did happen to be a man and white, you know, if you can't use your legs or are blind or so many things are autistic, are homosexual, are, which was viewed as a disorder at the time or disability of some kind, I guess. Definitely a medical issue that was wrong with the person. It even went so far as to encompass class. They had the term pauperism, which was treated not as a social state of not having enough money, but actually a biological state that you could like genetic, like you could measure someone was medically a pauper, uh, was a belief that in the 1800s, pauperism was used as a sort of like outgrouping pseudoscientific social hierarchical status. Oh yeah, I, I've never heard of that, but that makes so much sense. You even you even think of like stereotypical rich people, like oh, you don't want to get your blood mixed up with those riffraff. Like I, I think among the upper classes of like very wealthy people or landowning people throughout history, there's been a lot of that kind of sentiment that there, there's like a there's a inherent superiority in a way that was first thought of as religious or given by God. They're the lords, they're sovereigns, they're the people, you know, we're meant to rule over you because God said so. And then in the age of the enlightenment, etc., becoming biologicalized. I didn't know that the pauperism though, that's apparently standard. in 1891, the journal of the American medical association promoted the view that criminality had visual identifiers and was a, uh, what came from a bad stock of humans. So there was people who were born criminals and this in many instances would have a racial component but doesn't have an inherent racial component i think the the first gilded age autopsy was done by this guy named caesar lombroso and he noticed a ridge in the skull that he believed was primitive and indicative of inborn criminality so with all these different examples in this context it really it brings to mind just like the authors say in the book you know these are structures of thought that are made to justify and made to naturalize the rule of the powerful over the powerless so this social hierarchical ideology is being put through the lens of pseudoscience to justify all of these pre-existing things the domination of women the disenfranchisement and exclusion of the disabled and racialized slavery whatever the desires of the ruling class in terms of what they would like to be naturalized and normalized is given this sort of scientific veneer to create these pseudoscientific ideas of social hierarchies that are natural. And the context that a lot of this stuff arose is the period of the transatlantic slave trade and the colonization of the New World, which had people living on it for thousands and thousands of years before the Europeans arrived. So not super new. Yeah, and just like with race, once you start doing that, once you start dividing people into groups and calling one superior and one inferior based on the interests of the powerful people in society, it becomes this like self-perpetuating thing where we like create these categories and define people by these categories and then project them out onto the world shaping the way that we see and experience the actual world which isn't this strictly hierarchical some people are ordained by god or biology to be better than all others but a much more interesting state of difference and variation and complementarity so it ends up reinforcing itself by perpetuating these myths of these like essential biological categories where adherence to the purported biological aspects of it becomes socially enforced. Like you see this a lot in patriarchy and gender issues where things that have like literally nothing to do with anything that you could call a biological difference between men and women, like whether it's okay to wear pants or a dress, etc., become like 
tied to these biological things in really weird ways that like just affect people's perception of the world and reify these pseudo biological categories that we're using to justify pre-existing power structures. Another example of that sort of thing they mention in the book is the difference in athletic performance between black and white athletes when it comes to swimming versus running. And obviously there's a long history of racist exclusion from pools. As a result of that racism, cultural differences in the amount of people who go into swimming from black communities as a result, the highest performing swimmers at this current time tend to be white. That gets naturalized by racists as a biological difference, as if white people are somehow born to swim, amphibians. <laughs> um, but when you look at that historical context where people who are black were excluded from opportunities to participate in swimming and pools and so on for generations, even though that's not the case today, it makes sense that those impacts would still be felt in the current population. Yeah, that athletic stuff is so interesting too because people take it so seriously and think there's these like inher like some races are good at some sports and not good at others. Uh, and I just remember reading a while back about in the early 20th century there were a lot of Jewish basketball clubs, so there was just like a sentiment at the time in those circles that you know Jewish people are really really good at basketball, which isn't the current stereotype about basketball so it's just kind of one of those weird ways those things change over time it's a different race that's really good at basketball now but the reality is any scientist will tell you there is no genetic component <laughs> there is no genetic component of basketballality Another thing um, that we haven't mentioned yet, which is one of these crises that we face that's related to these sort of, you know, rooted into these ideas of social hierarchies and also has, you know, science versus pseudoscience elements to it is the environmental crisis. And one way this connects to everything is you look at these institutions promoting these pseudoscientific ideas of hierarchy of human beings over human beings. They were also promoting this idea, which also is rooted in religious ideas, but it's transmuted into a type of pseudoscientific idea of humans commanding and controlling the environment, uh, humans having dominion over the natural world, which isn't like the normal inherent way that all human beings think about the environment. There's variation, of course, but the people who are victimized by colonialism, you know, the African people who were displaced and enslaved by colonial actions, and indigenous peoples in the Americas who were displaced and enslaved by colonial actions, they tended to have views of the environment that weren't based on the domination and exploitation of it. So there's this institutional, elitist, institutional minority dominating the majority, which is something that perpetuates itself, you know, for example, even among men, you have the elite men who are oppressing and exploiting non-elite men. And then there's other circumstances where the non-elite men are given advantage over, for example, women or white men are given advantage over, for example, black men. That whole institutional structure is related deeply with the with the context of the environmental crisis that we face. These institutions and social clubs built the current situation that we have today. And in effect, and they believed, you know, at the time that these the oil industry became what it was, these sort of biological ideas of race were commonplace. The eugenics movement was massively popular in the United States in the early 1900s, for example, including with the rich, powerful politicians and so on. Um, and the result of this environmental crisis at this time, although it is coming for everyone, the result of this environmental crisis at this time is a disproportionate impact on communities of color and indigenous communities in what's called environmental racism. All these outgrowths of these social hierarchical institutions uh, have this deep interrelatedness. And I think our best chance at addressing these issues is to look at them as a whole holistically and address them all as best as we can. Um, so biological race, the idea of biological race is, it's a pseudoscientific idea popularized by elite institutions of command and control where a small group commands a larger group based on hierarchical ideas of worthiness and so on, often framed in racist, sexist, and always basically ableist terms that has the result of perpetuating the trends of colonialism, including the destruction of the natural environment. It just seems like hierarchical society's got to go. That's the social justice kaleidoscope. That's what I'm seeing looking through this you know, fractally color of a kaleidoscope, you know, you turn it and the makes patterns. Uh, 
guess it's not really a fractal in a kaleidoscope, but you know, it's nice to look at things from a bunch of different angles and come to the conclusion that we should build an egalitarian, uh, environmentally just society together. So this has been Social Justice Kaleidoscope. We can't get free unless we all get free. 